Hi, uh, welcome to our program highlighting research uh, manuscripts from the Cleveland Clinic Cardiology Fellowship. I'm Venu Menon, uh, the program director, as well as head of the section of clinical cardiology. And with me today is Chetan Hudaid, our former chief fellow and currently an interventional fellow uh, in our section. And Chetan's come out with an extremely important paper in JAMA highlighting outcomes in terms of stroke after TAVA from the TVT registry. So Chetan, first, congratulations on having a first author JAMA manuscript as a fellow, I just think it's terrific. Tell me a little bit about the hypothesis and the rationale for why you explored the TVT registry in this manner. Uh, thank you so much for having me and, uh, and for that uh, introduction. So th this project really was born out of our recognition that uh, here at the clinic, you know, we see that TAVR has been a complete blockbuster. You know, it's completely changed the way that we treat valvular heart disease, specifically AS. And uh, TAVR is maturing now to the point where it's a fairly it's a fairly advanced procedure. You know the procedure was FDA approved in 2011, and you know as you can see in the slides, over time the clinical trials of TAVR devices have suggested that the stroke rate after TAVR has declined. And stroke is a major complication. In the early trials, you know in the partner trials where TAVR was just coming out, the stroke rates were about five percent, and it was a concern initially that you know is this going to be an issue with with the procedure. But over time, the clinical trials have suggested stroke rates as low as 1% or less more recently. And so I think people in the field generally believe that post-TAVR stroke is decreasing. The devices have gone from first generation to second generation, now third generation devices, smaller delivery profiles, operator experience is better. And so I think it's a natural hypothesis that the risk of stroke after the procedure has probably gone down. But that's never been shown that in practice that that's the case. And so we had a very simple question, which is that in the United States, in the first five years of the experience in the United States, has the stroke rate changed? We would expect that it would with all of the things I mentioned, but nobody has actually shown that that's been the case. So tell us about your findings. So we used the, uh, the TVT registry to answer this question, because I think it's really the only way you can adequately address the question that we had. The TVT registry is really nice in the sense that it's a collaboration between the American College of Cardiology and Society of Thoracic Surgery. The registry is set up in such a way that every procedure, every transcatheter aortic valve done in this country is essentially in the registry because the hospitals must participate to be reimbursed for the procedure. So everybody's participating. So in our study, over 500 hospitals in the United States. And you know, we looked at since FDA approval of TAVR until the time we conducted the study, which was about a five plus year period. And we said, you know, we decided to focus on 30-day stroke. Now, there's, of course, people talk about long-term risk of stroke and these things, but we've done some background work that suggests that after about 30 days, the stroke risk goes back to background risk. So we wanted to focus on procedural stroke within 30 days. And we said, let's see what the stroke rate has done over time. That's the first question. And the second question is, is there anything that we're doing in terms of medical therapy that's associated with that risk? So, um, you know, the, the next slide shows that the risk of stroke um, is about 2.3% and within 30 days of TAVR. The majority of that risk temporarily is early, within the first three to four days after the procedure. Most of it is actually, you know, within the first 24 hours. Um, and that the majority of those events are ischemic strokes, not hemorrhagic strokes. Um, and what we looked at next is, has that rate, 2.3%, gone down over time? Because that's really the pivotal, pivotal question. And what you can see is that actually from 2011, really, through 2017, when we, when we sort of closed the data set in this study, that the rate is extremely stable. And the p-values aren't shown, but the p-values are all not significant. So the rate of stroke after TAVR in the United States in clinical practice has not changed despite the fact that the valves are getting safer, the operators are getting more experienced, and hospitals are getting more experienced, the, the stroke rate has been stable. Now, 2% is lower than what we see in clinical trials, and this study is, as I mentioned, based on a registry, but in, in the registry, the events are self-reported by the, by the operators in the hospital. So there is always a concern about under-reporting of events, and that may be one of the biases in this study. But irrespective of that, the rate itself is stable. So temporarily, there has been no change over time. Now, obviously, over time and in the near future, we're going to be doing TAVA in low-risk patients. So do you think that this stroke risk is a function of patient risk or procedure risk? Because obviously, a 2% risk in a 90-year-old is very different from a 2% risk 
mm-hmm. in a 65 year old. Do you have any insights into that? It's a phenomenal question and I think it's what's on everybody's mind is that as we start doing TAVR in lower risk patients, a risk of 2% is probably unacceptable you know, in a low risk patient in which the surgical mortality alone should be less than 1%. And so this data in that sense does not address that in the sense that you know, at the time of this study, TAVR has only been commercially approved for inoperable, high or intermediate risk patients. So low risk patients really are not included here for the most part. Um, but you know, the most recent trials on low risk patients suggest that the stroke rates with TAVR are fairly low. Now we need to prove that in clinical practice. I think that's the next phase is to say that now that you know, as, the, as the bar moves towards lower risk patients, can we show that we're achieving the same the same bar in clinical practice as we've demonstrated in clinical trials. And I think our study highlights the importance of proving that, that we all thought that stroke risk was going down because the trial suggested it, but the practice has not, has not caught up. And the other question I had, Chetan, was, you know, uh, obviously there's been data with Sentinel and other protective devices mm-hmm. about reducing stroke. What is the proportion of their utilization? And when you look at registries like this, do they show a protective effect? So that's a phenomenal question. So our data here goes through about May of 2017, and Sentinel was FDA approved around that time. So this study does not include the period during which embolic protection for TAVR has been FDA approved in the United States. So nobody knows the answer to your your question that is there an association between use of Sentinel and reduction in practice. And there's now multiple clinical trials of embolic protection in TAVR, which have, I would say, mixed results. But the device is approved. The FDA felt enough to approve it. Um, but I think that's also an important study that needs to be done, is to find out who's using Sentinel, and when they use it, is it associated with a benefit? You know, anecdotally, what we understand is that it's a minority of hospitals, not a majority of hospitals, that are using embolic protection on a routine basis. Now, some places may be using it selectively, but that pattern of use and the pattern of uptake of that device is still a, is still a mystery to a lot of people. So, Chetan, congratulations on this really important manuscript highlighting, one, the importance of having registries when you have a new procedure like this. And because obviously with drugs and other things, our surveillance has been exceedingly Mm. poor. And I think it's probably very reassuring, at least from the outside looking in, that as this uh, intervention has been incorporated around the country, we don't see a clear increase in stroke risk and that even with low volume or less experienced operators, the procedure gives us all the benefits that we know it does without any prohibitive um, risk from stroke. Any final impressions? No, I think that's, that's, you hit the nail on the head, which is that the, the, the skeptical or pessimistic way to view these data is, oh my goodness, the stroke risk has not gone down over time. But I think the optimist view of this is that 2% is uh, lower than we had in many of the first generation trials. And we've achieved 2% stably over time, despite the fact that every month that goes by, more and more TAVR centers are opening. So there are more novice operators and junior operators starting TAVR programs. And despite that, the stroke risk has not actually gone up. So I think there is a flip side to this coin. And so there's an optimist view and a pessimist view. And I think, but the reality is the rate has not changed. And we need novel strategies to try to address this, whether it be embolic protection or better medical therapy regimens or, or what have you. But I think there's room to improve here. Congratulations on this fantastic manuscript and thanks for joining us on this uh, uh, presentation. Thank you for having me.